Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Uh, you know, and it starts out as kind of a trivia question, and people people would say, say, is it me or you? Oh, this happened yesterday during a TV interview, so that- I've gotten pretty good at editing podcasts too. I'll so. bet you have. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Galveston Unscripted. This episode is undeniably educational, and I had an absolute blast sitting down with Edward T. Cottom Jr., otherwise known as Ed Cottom. Ed is author of multiple books, including Juneteenth, The Story Behind the Celebration, Battle on the Bay, The Civil War Struggle for Galveston, The Southern Journey of a Civil War Marine, and A Busy Week in Texas, Ulysses S. Grant's 1880 Visit to the Lone Star State. In between writing books, Ed can be found off the coast of Texas, searching for shipwrecks, or he just may be giving another interview to NPR, or serving as a chief investment officer at the Terry Foundation, the largest private source of scholarships at Texas universities. Ed discusses quite a bit in this episode, including the Civil War and the Battle of Galveston, the history behind Juneteenth. We also get a little bit into why studying history is important. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. And also, follow us on social media. It means the world to us. Galveston Unscripted is dedicated to educating and entertaining. If you haven't yet, check out the episode description. Click that link to the interactive map. We're utilizing this podcast and developing an audio tour of the entire island. And you can help by sharing this podcast and audio tour with locals and visitors alike. Welcome to Galveston, the world's largest free museum. This is your audio guide, Galveston Unscripted. Without further ado, let's jump right into my conversation with Edward T. Cottom Jr. Ed, what got you started exploring and studying Galveston and Civil War history? Something that started years ago as sort of a trivia question was, uh, you know, what what was the last major Confederate port? And it turns out that it's Galveston, Texas. And I always used to tell people that, and they were always very surprised about it. And so th- that kind of set me off for writing uh, the first book on the Battle of Galveston and the history of Galveston as a, as a uh, Civil War port. But it, it also kind of led me to think in terms of a bigger picture, you know, why is it? that Galveston ended up the war as the, the last major Confederate port. And why is it that uh, we have Juneteenth and that, you know, the last major intact body of enslaved people in the entire country ended up in Texas? Why, why did this end up kind of being the end of the road at the end of the Civil War for the Confederacy, for slavery, for all of these many things? And, and it, it kind of comes all the way back to the ge- geography. Uh, you know, when, when the Civil War broke out, Texas was one of the largest coastlines of the entire Confederacy. Uh, and Texas was a very new state, and really the interior of the state was up almost completely uninhabited except for Native Americans. And so you had this kind of a thin wedge along the Texas coast. It was very rich agriculturally uh, and culturally, but it, it really hadn't kind of come into its own yet. It wasn't the Texas that we we know today. And that story of how we came from being this uh, you know, wild place to the Republic of Texas uh, to a growing state to one of the most powerful states in the most powerful country on earth. In some ways, it's a relatively new story, and it's something that I don't think we've ever really kind of come to terms with it and understood. And even today, you know, Galveston has this reputation for being a wild place in the 1940s, and today it's kind of a bedroom community for Houston in some ways. But that's not the real story of Galveston when you go back in time. In the in the 1830s, it was one of the the really growing ports on the on the Gulf Coast. And if you had picked up people and said, you know, what's going to be the really big city in Gal in Texas uh, going forward at the time of the Revolution, everybody would have said without question it was going to be Galveston, no doubt about it. And if it wasn't Galveston, it was going to be one of the major ports of Texas. It was going to be Indianola. It was going to be Sabine Pass. It was going to be one of these places. And yet, uh, because of the weather and hurricanes and everything, all of those places went by the board. And so Galveston became, at, you know, in the 1861 when the Civil War broke out, it is by far, in a way, you know, the leading port in Texas, and it's the largest city in Texas. And so Houston was kind of its little brother. And, and nobody really thought about Houston as much uh, at the time of the Civil War, except that the only thing that made Houston significant at the time was 
that if you draw a line in from Galveston, which was destined to be the best port because it, the, the water was so deep, and then you draw a line across so that it went at the top of all the bays that came into Texas, those two lines just kind of happened to intersect near what is today Houston. And so Houston became sort of the center of the railroads that were feeding into and then servicing the port of Galveston. And so that sort of a geographical accident created Houston. And, you know, the people of Galveston kind of thought at the time of Houston's their little brother and sort of their supporter, and nobody thought it would ever really amount to anything. And even even when the Civil War ended and Galveston went back to being, you know, the, the fastest growing port in America, it looked like Houston was just going to be kind of an adjunct service for, for Galveston. And then the 1900 storm came around and everything changed. And it reversed the commercial fortunes of Galveston. But in essence, what had been the commercial uh, springboard for Texas, which was Galveston, then just basically moved inland and became one of the largest cities in the United States. But it all started here in Galveston in this very special and unique place that has reinvented itself over the centuries in a number of different ways. It's still reinventing itself today, and it, it's truly a remarkable place. One thing that I would like to do a little bit more research on myself is the cotton clads and how they came into the Battle of Galveston. So but could you tell us a little bit about the Battle of Galveston? Sure. Uh, General John Bankhead Magruder is sent down from Richmond, Virginia in the late fall of 1862 and comes to command here in Texas. And by the time he gets here, Galveston had already been captured by the Union in October, mainly by a, a group of, uh, of naval gunboats. And they were under the guns of those gunboats here in Galveston. And General Magruder arrived from Virginia and immediately set out to try and recapture the city because he realized something that uh, the prior general had not, and that is that to have any influence over the Confederacy west of the Mississippi, you had to control Texas. And the key to controlling Texas, he said, was to control Galveston. So to recapture Galveston, he came up with this incredibly bold plan, which involved basically firing a number of cannons from the waterfront over on the Strand area and, and, and even toward the water from there. And then in addition, he was going to come up behind the Federal fleet with a fleet of gunboats. But of course, there was no uh, naval presence to speak of in, in Texas waters at the time on the Confederate part. And so what he had to do was kind of create some gunboats of his own uh, by arming some of the package steamers that went from Galveston to Houston. And General Magruder had been in Virginia and had, a, and had actually witnessed the battle uh, between the Monitor and the uh, CSS Virginia. And he'd seen that. And of course, those were ironclads. And he didn't have enough iron down here to do anything like that and, and certainly didn't have the resources to create ironclads. But what he had in excess was cotton bales because, again, they, were, they had cotton down here and they were, they were compressing it and trying to you know, put it on board blockade runners at the time. But with Galveston and federal hands, that was hard to do. So he had a lot of bales of cotton. So what he tried to do was to put these, these cotton bales on these, these uh, steamers that he was going to try to make into improvised gunboats. And he put them all along the rails and made them basically about two bales high and one, uh, two bales deep, creating a kind of a knee rail, knee rail or something that the guys could kneel on and then fire on from aboard. And he put a couple of cannon in the front of each one of these gunboats, the Neptune and the Bayou City. And then he had 300 sharpshooters, 150 on each boat, that he put behind these cotton bales, and they were going to be the naval part of the uh, Battle of Galveston. And then in addition to that, he took some more bales. He had an excess and what he did was he put a large naval gun on top of a railroad car and put cotton bales all along that uh, that rail car. And he took that that rail mounted cannon, uh, which was armored with uh, cotton bales, and brought it down to Galveston and fired it during the Battle of Galveston. It, what, what's unique about this and interesting to me is it was only the second time in military history in the world where they had used a piece of rail-mounted artillery like this. And so what he was experimenting with was basically armored, uh, mobile cannon, you know, artillery pieces. 
And at the end of the war, they were actually trying to take railroad iron and take railroad cars and make them into a turreted uh, cannon-firing uh, armored vehicle. So what they were really experimenting with was the predecessor of the tank. It's, it's, it's fascinating. That is fascinating. Is there um, anywhere we can find any Civil War battle damage in Galveston? Yes, uh, there, there's a lot of Civil War damage in uh, in Galveston. The most the most probably obvious place is if you go over to the Henley Building at the corner of 20th and Strand and go back to the seventh column from the Strand, you'll see up at the top of it of that Capitol uh, that it's missing a big piece of it, and that is damage from the Battle of Galveston. So when the the Mitchell people were restoring the Henley Building and I, I knew they were going to do it. I, I sent them a frantic email saying, well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm loving what you're going to do with the Henley building, but please don't fix the damage on the seventh column because that's Civil War related. They assured me that it would not, and they did a wonderful job in restoring the building. So you're an advocate for Civil War preservation. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and I guess, trying to uh, preserve and get the history of the Civil War out there? Yes, I'm a life member of the Civil War uh, Preservation Trust. I've been very active in in battlefield preservation, uh, not only in Texas, but around the country. And I'm not only active on land in that, but I'm also active in in the maritime sites as well. And I serve as a Texas Marine steward for the Texas Historical Commission and am involved in a number of uh, shipwreck projects as a project historian. That's been really interesting over the years. What kind of shipwrecks? We had uh, the the biggest one. I've had, I guess, two that were really interesting in this area. Uh, the the most prominent one is the USS Westfield, which was involved in the Battle of Galveston, was destroyed at the end of the battle by the uh, Union commander in, in charge of the fleet, who decided to blow up his his boat instead of having it fall in the hands of the Confederacy. But it was one of those things. It was a complete mistake and a, a debacle, and uh, the charge that he set went off before he was ready, and it killed him and twelve of his men. Uh, but that that wreck sat at the bottom of Galveston Bay for a long time, and then when the uh, Texas City Channel was going to be widened, the U.S. Corps of Engineers uh, did some archaeological work and discovered the original site of the Westfield, and it had to be moved, uh, and so went in to pull that stuff up, and it was an amazing collection of artifacts, including a nine-inch Dahlgren cannon that nobody at the time had picked up on because they, they thought they'd accounted for all the guns and had salvaged them all, but there was still this one big gun left. And so today, if you go to the Texas City Museum, there's an absolutely fabulous collection of artifacts that were conserved by Texas A&M and College Station. Uh, and they, they did a marvelous job and created a wonderful exhibit. It's one of the best uh, Civil War uh, marine exhibits in the entire United States. The uh, the other shipwreck that I've worked on over the years that was probably pretty prominent was the uh, battlefield between the CSS Alabama, which was a big commerce raider, very famous ship, and the USS Hatteras. And this was about 25 miles uh, off of the Galveston coast. But that originated when the Alabama, which was one of the most famous uh, ships of the Civil War, got within sight of the port of Galveston. They were coming to try and attack Union shipping, but didn't realize Galveston had been recaptured. And when they arrived in sight of the, of the shore, uh, the Union sent a, a gunboat after it, the Hatteras, chased it offshore for a long period of time. And then those two gunboats around darkness uh, had a fight that lasted about 13 minutes. And at the end of it, the Hatteras was sunk. And what was important about that was this was probably the first time that an iron-hulled warship had been sunk in military combat anywhere. And it was also one of the first decisive battles between two steamships. And so it was a very interesting thing, and that wreck had been discovered in the 1960s, but not a lot of work had been done it and done on it. And a, a, a large operation with a, a number of agencies, uh, including NOAA and, and some other folks, was involved with it, went out there to do a... a uh, laser uh, survey of the wreck and to this to today you can actually go online and see a fly through under you know a virtual fly through of this wreck as as it sits off the coast today and it's in, a, in remarkable condition out there but it was fun to do that and one of the one of the most funny thing about that was i i actually had a uh, carte de visite of civil war photograph of the captain of the hatteras who had been captured with his crew there at the end of the battle. They 
Alabama had taken the crew off uh, except for two casualties and took them all to Jamaica. Uh, but I had this picture of Blake, and I was just uh, talking to some of the news reporters on, on the operation, and I was laughing with them that, and held it up and said, this is the first time that Captain Blake's been back to the Hatteras uh, since 1863. And they thought that was so funny that they printed the picture of me with that that CDV holding it at the side of the wreck, and it was on the front page of the USA Today. So it was a, a funny thing. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> During the Battle of Galveston tour, you spoke a little bit about the father and son story of the Lee family. At the end of the Battle of Galveston, uh, one of the staff officers on General Magruder's staff, on the Confederate staff, was a man named Albert M. Lee, L-E-A. And he went to the waterfront because he knew that his son, Edward Lee, had been serving as the first officer, the executive officer, on board the USS Harriet Lane, which had been captured by the Union during the battle. And so this was literally a case when father was fighting against son. And at the conclusion of the battle, uh, Lee hurried across to the waterfront, was rowed out to the the Harriet Lane, which had been captured, and found his son mortally wounded on the deck. And they spoke for a few moments, and then and then Albert went away to see if he could find his son some medical attention. But of course, by then it was too late, and he returned only to find that his his son had died. Uh, but at at he asked about the son in his his last moments and was told that at the end the boy kept repeating to everybody would ask uh i'm fine my father is here my father is here and so the next day something really really remarkable happened in galveston and it was at the cemetery complex that's the trinity episcopal cemetery today over off broadway in that enormous cemetery complex and at that cemetery a joint funeral was held for uh, this young man, uh, Edward Lee, and his commanding officer, a man named Jonathan Wainwright, who was the captain of the Harriet Lane. And, and Wainwright himself was a Mason. And so the Galveston Masons, even though they were Confederate and this was a Union officer, held the Masonic service for uh, their deceased uh, former foe, Jonathan Wainwright, and, and had the whole service there at the Trinity C- uh, Cemetery. And not only the Confederates in the area were assembled, but all the Union prisoners as well. And they all were there while Albert Lee then read the Episcopal service over his son in this this, uh, cemetery with both sides present for it. And after the war, a a marker was put up uh, for Edward Lee. Uh, Jonathan Wainwright's body was taken north, but... Uh, Edward Lee still stands there today, and it's a very simple stone that has a broken anchor on it and the inscription that this is the uh, last resting place of uh, Edward Lee, killed in battle January 1, 1863, Galveston, Texas. And the only other thing on it is the quotation, my father is here. And, you know, to me, that says really more about what this war was about and what it involved than any other monument I can think of anywhere in the country. And that's, that's kind of unique for Galveston. We had a very special uh, coming together of people right in the middle of the war for this one very poignant experience. And it's something that uh, uh, I think a lot of people don't know about today, but, but everybody is impressed by it and, and has to think about it because it's an amazing experience. Uh, You've written multiple books on the Civil War from different angles. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your other Civil War publications? Right. I started in 1998 with a book on the Battle of Galveston, and that originated because I had a weekend place down here and had always been interested in the Civil War. And I went to the Rosenberg Library, which is a magnificent place to do anything relating to history and particularly Texas and Galveston history. And I went over there and said, I'd like to see the book on Galveston, the Civil War. And they said, there's not one. And I said, there's not one? How can that be? You know, Galveston's the last major Confederate port. How can, there's not any book on it, really? No, they said, there's not really a book on it. And so I waited, thinking, well, someone surely has to have one in progress. And I waited about five years, and nobody really had anything in, in, in the process. And I said, you know, I'm a lawyer. I could research. I could do all this. I'm just going to do this myself. And so five years later... I came out with a book, and the University of Texas Press was kind enough to print it on the Battle of Galveston. 
And while I was in the process of researching and writing that book, I became familiar with the fact that some of the Confederate soldiers that were had uh, artillerymen actually that had fought in that battle were this unusual group of Irishmen from the uh, you know, saloons of Houston and the bartender who was a man named Richard Dick Dowling. And I knew that he had fought in this uh, really unusual battle at the Battle of Sabine Pass that Jefferson Davis called the most amazing victory in all of military history. But nobody had ever really done a scholarly book on that battle. And so five years later, sure enough, I wrote a book on the Battle of Sabine Pass and, and started giving battlefield tours over there as well as in Galveston. And while I was in the course of doing that, I got really interested in the Union ships that were involved in the Battle of Galveston and the Battle of Sabine Pass. So the next book was a, a book called uh, The Southern Journey of a Civil War Marine, and it had a, a diary of a, 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 Union sail, a Union Marine, actually, and the drawings that were drawn by the surgeon on board the same ship. It was almost like a narrated slideshow of the Civil War. And I got on national public radio with that book and it got it got to be pretty popular and then the next uh, couple of books I did were on on mainly Texas subject but I you know I always used to take people on tours of of uh, Galveston yeah, I've probably given more tours of Civil War battlefields in Texas than anybody ever and I always used to take them by this parking lot down at the corner of 22nd and Strand, and I would say, here's something really remarkable happened. And I would say, this is the ground zero origination point of Juneteenth. And many years ago, people would say, June what? Because uh, most people on these tours, particularly, you know, most people that were, that were white on these tours had not heard of that or were not really familiar with the whole concept. And... I used to take them there and said, you know, this is something important, but there was, it's a parking lot today. There was no sign. There was no historic marker. There was nothing there, but it was really, really important. And I tried to explain the significance of that site. And I've been keeping notes on that for uh, really more than 40 years, I guess. And finally got around to, to writing uh, what turned out to be the first scholarly book on the history behind Juneteenth. And as just dumb luck would have it, we released that book about a month before Juneteenth was declared a national holiday. And suddenly everybody was interested in what happened at the parking lot in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865. And suddenly everybody wanted to know how to, how to visit Galveston and see this important part of history and what were we doing to preserve it. And we're still kind of going through the, the growing pains of how to, to, to really make that history available in a way that people can understand it and appreciate it and enjoy it without, you know, making it commercial or turning it into something it shouldn't be. Can you tell us a little bit about your research into uh, Juneteenth in general? Juneteenth was an interesting subject to research because, again, the people that were the most affected by it, uh, the black inhabitants of, of Texas, really didn't keep diaries, didn't write a lot of letters, what we do have from those people is interviews that were recorded in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, they're called the Slave Narrative Project. They're mainly in the Library of Congress. And you can, you can research those and you can find uh, those accounts. And I, I, I've read hundreds of them, of course. Uh, and, and it's really interesting to do that. And, and then you can go back through the newspapers. You can go back through the diaries and letters of the officers and, and military people that were here. But trying to recreate that was, was very complex. And, and what made it particularly challenging for me was that there was this whole mythology about Juneteenth that I had to dismantle kind of brick by brick before assembling the history in, in, in a way that we could rely on. Because it, every year there had been this thing that was printed in the newspaper that General Gordon Granger had come here on June 19th and had gone up on a balcony and read either the Emancipation Proclamation or some said this General Orders Number 3 to all these assembled people, including a number of newly freed, uh, freed enslaved people. And if this would, had been a very big secret, and they were suddenly surprised to learn uh, that they were now free. And the truth was that General Granger had almost nothing to do with the Juneteenth order, that he had not read it from the balcony. We have no contemporary evidence that that would have happened. We had very few uh, 
enslaved people who had been freed in Galveston, Texas on June 19th of 1865, and that instead what happened was he arrived, he uh, went to this uh, uh, his headquarters, which was, again, at 22nd and Strand at the Osterman Building, a building that no longer stands. And he had issued this order, but most of it had been written either by General Phil Sheridan in New Orleans or his young clerk, uh, a, a staff officer named Frederick Emery, who was a, a basically a, an anti-slavery abolitionist newspaper editor from Kansas who had been very clever and inserted this great sentence in the Juneteenth order about the importance of absolute equality. And this is what had happened, and this had been issued. It, it had very little press coverage at the time. It, was, it wasn't considered all that groundbreaking at the time, but because of the unusual way in which it was composed, it, it became something that was featured in newspapers all around the country. And in particular, it ran in newspapers in Texas for months afterwards, the entire series of general orders. And because it said uh, that the freed people were supposed to stay where they were and continued working, it was actually read to uh, groups of you know freed people by their former owners and their overseers. And years later, when I would pick up these these uh, narratives by the people that had been freed, they all said something about it. They could remember it as though it was yesterday, the day that the Freedom Paper was read to them, the Freedom Paper. And sometimes they called it the Long Paper. Sometimes they called it the Freedom Paper. But I kept struggling with what that was, and then finally I figured out that it was, in fact, the Juneteenth order that was being read to them. And, in fact, that's why they ended up as a kind of a collective thing, deciding to commemorate emancipation on the day that the Freedom Paper originated, which was June 19th, 1865, the original Juneteenth in Galveston, Texas. So that's how the word was uh, originally spread, and I guess the most efficient way to spread it was by the newspaper. Uh, it was spread by way of newspaper, and it was also spread by way of handbills. Now, these handbills, you know, were posted and sent out, and, and you know, cavalry riders would take them around and read them and post them and everything. We still have one of these that I know of. It's in the collection of the Dallas Historical Society. It's a remarkable thing. But that's the way it was spread. It wasn't spread by people reading it from balconies. That was not really a good way to spread it because, again, most of the uh, black people that would have been affected by this order in terms of being freed, they didn't live in, in Galveston. They lived primarily in rural areas. Galveston had uh, the entirety of Galveston County, not, not the city, the entire county had less than 0.6% of the uh, freed people in Texas. I'll go ahead and ask you, is there any, are you working on any projects, any more books? I'm working on a book, uh, a couple of books, actually. I'm, I'm working on one on the critical decisions, the Galveston campaigns. And this kind of originated, I, I used to give tours where I would take around uh, young military officers, and they, I would give them what they call staff rides. And in a staff ride, you take a military officer around and you say, here's the situation. You're this person. You're standing here in this particular situation. These are your options. These are the pluses and minuses. Now, if you were in this situation here on January 1 of 1863, what would you do and why? It's a very valuable exercise and something that all these people should do uh, and is part of their military education. And the University of Tennessee started a series called the Critical Decision Series, where they basically formalized this process for all the major battles of the Civil War. And they've done it for, you know, Gettysburg and uh, Chancellorsville and things like that. And so I'm doing one for the Galveston campaigns of, I think it's called the 20, ma the 20 Definitive Decisions of the, of the Galveston campaigns. And in the other book I'm working on, I'm, I'm probably going to do something on the, uh, the, the working title is uh, Rockets, Submarines, and Tanks, the Ingenious Texas Confederacy. Is there any, any other Galveston history not pertaining to the Civil War that you you particularly enjoy studying and, and learning or, or some of your favorite facts about Galveston? Well, I think one of the most interesting things that happened to Galveston after the Civil War is something that most people don't even know happened. And I actually released a book on that uh, earlier, uh, I guess last year. And what happened was the General Ulysses S. Grant came to Galveston in 1880. 
And when he came here, he had already been, you know, the, of course, the successful general of the Civil War. He had become president twice uh, and was in the running for a third term. He'd, he'd toured the world and had been, you know, more touring than any other uh, president in history. And he had, on this occasion, gone down to Cuba and then over to Mexico, where he, you know, he had fought in the Mexican War and he went to show his wife uh, the scenes of where he'd, where he'd actually fought. And in the course of coming back, they came to Texas, and he came to Galveston for the very first time. And you got to imagine, this was something remarkable at the time. Uh, nobody in Texas had ever seen a celebrity this big. Uh, Grant was the most famous person to ever come to Texas. It would be like if the Pope and the Beatles and Lady Gaga showed up at one time. This, this was the kind of thing. And everybody in Galveston showed up for the general to arrive. And, you know, there, there were rumors he'd been lost to sea. He finally came there. He, he landed very close over to where the cruise ship terminal is today. He came up 22nd, 20, uh, I guess 23rd Street, and, and he stayed at the Tremont Hotel, and they had a banquet here. And for my money, uh, uh, if you went back in Galveston history and wanted to pick one night, one event that you could be at in Galveston history, it'd be a fly on the wall it would be that night at the Tremont Hotel in 1880, because there everybody in Galveston of any of any consequence was there. And in addition to General Grant, his wife, you had General Phil Sheridan who had fought with him. You had General E. O. C. Ord there. Uh, there were all the famous luminaries of Texas were there. And Grant gave a speech, which was remarkable because he never gave speeches. So Grant gave a speech and had this incredible dinner. We still have the menu from it. I think it had like 23 courses, wild things you would never imagine. And we know every toast that was given to him, everything he said, everything everybody said about him, it was, if you had to pick a social event, this was the thing to be. And, and what's really neat about it is General Grant was there, and in addition to him, there was a General EOC Ord, O-R-D, who was one of his uh, commanders at Appomattox, and then Sheridan had been there at Appomattox. And they'd all been there in the room when, when Lee surrendered to Grant. And actually, as soon as the surrender was over and the, the uh, event was concluding, uh, General Sheridan went in and brought one of, bought one of the tables, the table where uh, General Grant had signed the surrender papers, and then General Ord uh, bought the other table from uh, the homeowner there, Wilbur McLean, and he, he bought that one because Lee had signed the papers on that table. Uh, Sheridan's table is in the Smithsonian Institution. Ord's table is in the Chicago Historical Society. All those three people in that one room here in Galveston, Texas in 1880, along with Ulysses S. Grant, you know, one of the most famous people ever to come to Texas and one of the most successful American success stories because he, he went from nobody. He was, a, he was a store clerk on the edge of complete failure in 1861 to within almost 10 years, he became president of the United States. It's one of the greatest success stories in history and, and one of the stories that I don't think we tell enough in Galveston. I'll be ordering that book as soon as we get up from this table. <laughs> so I understand you are a part of a major scholarship pro program? I, I work for the uh, Terry Foundation, and what we do is provide scholarships to uh, needy students that want to attend Texas public colleges. Uh, and it, it's an interesting historical st story in itself. Uh, Howard Terry, for whom I worked for many years, grew up poor in, in a little town of Cameron, Texas, in the middle of the state. And he went to the University of Texas on a football scholarship, and he always credited that thing with, cha with changing his life. So when he'd gotten up and, and made a significant amount of money in his business career, he decided he wanted to give back. But he didn't want to, you know, have people building statues of him and naming buildings after him, things like that. He just kept thinking back to what had changed his life. And he decided that he would basically take his entire family fortune, he and his wife, and they would set up this foundation, and all the foundation would do would be to provide scholarships to needy people to go to Texas public colleges. And we've been doing it now for a little over 30 years. It's been a remarkable thing. And, you know, I think about it in terms of history. And the state of Texas, through the University of Texas, uh, basically gave him a scholarship that, as far as I can 
figure out total entirety for the, his entire four years about five thousand dollars at most. It probably was less than that. But so far, we've given away through his foundation over three hundred and thirty million dollars in scholarships and chased thousands of lives and paid the uh, state back many, many times over. I I kid and say that uh, it was probably the greatest investment the state of Texas ever made. Texas A&M Galveston, where you you, uh, went to school, was one of our schools. Uh, Well, I I should have applied. I should have applied. I love the students over there. (laughs) Yeah, man. Uh, We get into the maritime industry, and then we get out because we start a podcast. That's right. (laughs) Uh, Where can people find you around the 1st of January? I almost always get uh, tours of the Battle of Galveston in January. Around the, it's we don't do it usually on the first of January because it's a crazy time. Even though that's the anniversary, uh, we usually do it the first weekend after the first of January. And and uh, I give these tours for the Galveston Historical Foundation, and and uh, we try to you know commemorate some of the events that happened there. I take people on basically walking tours of the Strand. Uh, usually starting somewhere around the Henley building, and we end up at the site of the Juneteenth order uh, just because it's a, a kind of a perfect location. And, you know, my wife kids me about I can go almost anywhere in Galveston. And I don't know, don't know where I am on a contemporary basis, but I can tell you what was there in the 1860s. That's glorious. So I'm going to ask you this. I've never asked anybody this before, and I think I want to start asking it on all my podcasts. Why is history important? History is important because, and you hear the standard things about it doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And and it it really does. Uh, I I am always asking myself why things happened the way they do. And I think it's really important to figure out why things happened the way they did, because that's the only way you can really figure out how, what things are going to happen now. You know, I'm a military historian by background, and I, I've studied in intense, almost excruciating detail why decisions were made and why they worked out the way they did, whether they were successful or unsuccessful. But people are making those decisions on a constant basis today. And I, I read the headlines and uh, read about the decisions that are being made over in places like the Ukraine. And, and, and I think to myself, people that make those kind of decisions need to know history. Because if you understand history, you can understand why things turn out the way they are. For example, if you look at the Civil War, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm constantly looking at is logistics. Uh, the, one of the reasons the Union had such a difficult time on the Texas coast was that getting steamboats down to the Gulf of Mexico and then supplying them with coal and food and a continuing source of men and medicine and water and things like that. That was a continuing problem down here. And if you look at what happened in the Ukraine with the Russians and supplying their men with fuel and food and water, it's, it's, a, it's the same problem and the same issue. It's just something that just is inherent in warfare. But you need to know that and you need to have studied that in order to appreciate it on a go-forward basis. And I, I think that's one of the main reasons I encourage people to study history. Well, Ed, thank you so much for joining me today on Galveston Unscripted. I really, really appreciate it. Delighted. Thank you for listening in to Galveston Unscripted. Please go rate, review, and subscribe anywhere you find podcasts. And if you want to keep up with Galveston Unscripted, follow us on social media. We are literally everywhere. Thank you to all of those who have already reached out to us to let us know what you think about this podcast. And thank you to all those who've recommended episodes and topics. Most of them are already in the works. So if you haven't reached out yet, let us know what you thought about this episode. Reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You can send me an email. Just check out the link in the description below. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what you don't want to hear. Any feedback is appreciated. Once again, thank you for listening to Galveston Unscripted, and we'll see you next time. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description.